This stuff does not scare him at all. He uh, was trying to, he spun in, in qualifying last race at Charlotte. Let's watch but his hands. I in think there, in Jack. Charlotte, they had to go to a backup car. They actually hit in Charlotte. Yeah. Good morning. Our primary objective today is to apply Newton's laws to understand the motion of the car that you just saw. Secondary objective, to apply Newton's laws to circular motion or turning and understand the forces acting on a car. However, our ultimate objective today is to understand centripetal acceleration and centripetal forces. So let's begin with Newton's first law. An object at rest will remain at rest. An object in motion will remain moving at a constant speed in a straight line, unless acted on by an unbalanced force. And notice, once again, without any forces, the car moves in a straight line. Well, in the real world, however, some friction always exists, which may lead to a spin. And you can see that here. And notice the car moved in a straight line. We can also see that for the spin that occurred in this video. Whoa! And to, to drop it in Blanchemont and not hit anything, is that's uh, a miracle, <laughs> Frank. Notice that the car moves in a straight line. It just doesn't have enough force. Similarly here for this particular spin. Once again, it seems that the car is moving in a straight line. And we can see that from the skid marks. It's moving in a straight line. And so for the car to turn and hence no longer move in a straight line, according to Newton's first law, it needs an unbalanced force. That unbalanced force in most situations for a car is turning on a flat surface is friction. So besides friction, what factors determine if a car can negotiate a turn? I want you to focus on the speed of the car. Initially, it's going to be set to 7.4 meters per second. The car will attempt to make a turn. Where the arrow is pointing, there is ice. Let's pay attention to the motion of the car when it attempts to make a turn at the ice at 7.4 meters per second. So the car is approaching at 7.4 meters per second. It hits the ice patch and it can make the turn. Now what we're going to do is increase the speed. Let's see what happens. Hmm, notice at a higher speed, as soon as the car hits the ice, it can no longer make the turn. So clearly, speed is a factor for a car when negotiating a turn. Now let's see the effect of radius on the car's ability to turn. We already know that 11.4 meters and at 7.4 meters per second, the car can safely negotiate this turn. Let's see, however, as we decrease the radius to 5.6 meters. Notice the car could not complete the turn. Friction, speed, and turning radius all seem to have an impact on a car's ability to turn. So how is turning in a circle connected to these factors specifically, speed, and turning radius? Well, they're connected through a turbine physics that we call centripetal acceleration. So you may be asking, how does an object accelerate if the speed is constant? When an object turns, even at constant speed, it accelerates. Because acceleration is not simply a change in speed, 
It's a change in velocity. And so acceleration also occurs when a change of direction happens. Notice I've circled the vector. The vector illustrates the direction of motion. Notice that the velocity vector is changing direction. Therefore, the car must be accelerating as it's turning, since its velocity is changing. The direction is changing. So the question is, what direction is the acceleration actually in? Well, I've circled the acceleration vector there, and let's play the video and see. Notice that the acceleration vector is always pointing towards the center of the circle. And so the direction of the acceleration is towards the center. It's also perpendicular to the velocity. And so these are the characteristics of centripetal acceleration. The acceleration must point towards the center and it must be perpendicular to the velocity. The formula for centripetal acceleration is given as speed squared divided by turning radius. Or, symbolically, it is AC equals V squared over R, where the C, subscript C, stands for centripetal. Viewing this formula, as speed increases, what happens to centripetal acceleration? Well, it increases. As turning radius decreases, what happens to centripetal acceleration? Once again, centripetal acceleration increases. Higher speed, greater acceleration. Tighter turning radius, tighter turn. Greater centripetal acceleration. So what about the force? What direction does the force acting on a car while experiencing centripetal acceleration point in? What direction is the unbalanced force, in this case friction, in? Well, for this, we have to look at the second law. Newton's second law states the acceleration of an object is proportional to the net force acting on it. What does that mean? The bigger the net force, the bigger the acceleration. And in the same direction as the net force. Whatever direction the net force points in, the object is accelerating in the same direction. Friction then acts in the same direction as the centripetal acceleration towards the center. Friction in this case would be called the centripetal force. Specifically when a car is turning at a constant speed on a flat surface. So the ultimate objective, remember, was to understand centripetal acceleration and centripetal forces. So let's look at this now with some equations. Normally the second law we would write F net equals friction. That's the only force acting on the car. However, whenever dealing with centripetal forces, we will be very specific. Fc equals friction. Fc and F net have the same meaning. Remember that F net we can write as MA, and we can also write FC as being MAC, where the C again stands for centripetal. And so substituting into that equation, we end up with MAC equals friction. We have our formula that centripetal acceleration equals V squared over R. And substituting that, into the equation, we end up with the following equation that governs the motion of the object. Now every equation tells a story. And this equation also tells a story. Friction is determined by the tires, by the age of the tires, the surface that the tires come into contact in, 
those are the factors that control the friction. And every tire on a particular surface has a maximum value. It's limited by the type of tire and by the surface and the conditions of the surface. If it's wet, dry, icy. But remember, there's always a maximum amount of friction. That side of the equation tells us how much force, or in this case, how much friction is required to safely complete a turn. So let's look at this graphic here, and specifically the graph. The white column represents the maximum force of friction the tires can exert. Currently, we have a speed of 5 meters per second and the radius 11.4 meters. And notice the centripetal force with those values is much less than the maximum force of friction. Keep that in mind today. Now that maximum force of friction is determined by many factors. Now we're going to increase the speed of the car. And notice what happens. Greater speed means greater acceleration. Greater acceleration means greater force. Now we're at around 50% of the maximum force of friction. We're going to keep increasing the speed. Again, greater acceleration leads to greater force, and you could see that in the graphic. And now we're right on the edge. At 18.1 meters per second, we're almost at the maximum force of friction the tires can exert. Let's see what happens if we go any faster. Notice we have gone beyond the maximum force of friction that the tires can exert. And when that happens, the car spins out. And that's what happened here. There simply wasn't enough friction for the specific turning radius and speed. The acceleration was too large. Next video in this series, you'll see a typical physics word problem. Hope you enjoyed this video. Have a great day. Bye-bye.